Let's see if I can figure out how to express this. While we're here, if you're blood bought by the Lord of Jesus Christ, the Lord is fashioning you, the Holy Spirit is is weaving and fashioning a, a garment, a wedding garment that you're going to don on the other side. Now this garment goes from head to toe. And it's being fashioning even now. And it'll be through when we go to the other side, like I said. But as much of the garment is resting upon you now, how much of that wedding garment are you donning to the glory of God? How do you feel about the wedding garment is my question to you this morning. The one that Jesus died for, the one that's going to issue you in to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I hope it brings a smile to your face. It should do more than that. The people crying Looking on a man would think That's such a tragedy But what the world could not see when they nailed him to that tree He broke the chains of sin And he set men free Oh, if you know it, sing it. The chorus is beautiful. Love grew Where the blood of hope sprang up for men in sin and misery 2,000 years ago sin died oh sin died where the blood fell oh I'm so his precious blood covers me. Thorns of violence, thorns of hate were growing wild. All the pain that sin. You know it was so very plain to see But when the blood came streaming down the cross Where my Savior bled and died He broke the chains of sin and he set men free. Oh, sing it with me. You know it. Here we go. Love grew where the blood fell. Flowers of hope sprang up for men 
in sin and misery. Two thousand years ago, sin died, oh sin died, where the blood fell. Oh, I'm so glad His precious blood covered me. chapter 5 in just a minute or two. Romans chapter 5. But as I look around this morning and I talk to people all the time out in public, I have found one thing that a lot of people do and it's making them miserable is there are a lot of people that go to bed every night wondering if they did enough for the day to get them into heaven if they died that night. And they do not understand what the Christian walk is all about to start with. Amen. There's a song that I, I think it's come out in the last year or two by a contemporary secular artist by the name of Harry Styles. Anybody know who Harry Styles is? I know you would. <laughs> Lord, y'all are old. Okay. I'm just a spring chicken. Well, <laughs> well anyway, he wrote this song called Sign of the Times. It's not even a Christian song. But he makes a, uh, it, it, it's a song about somebody that's dying and he said, you can't bribe the door on your way to the sky in his stumbling way. And then he makes a statement. He said, you look really good down here, but you're not really good. Now, let's just be honest. If most everybody in here knew us, they wouldn't love us, would they? That's true. Everybody in here has had thoughts that would just burn everybody else up in here, or it ought to. And yet we are struggling and wanting to know, did I, did I do everything exactly right as I should have? And, and, and did I do this? And did I do that? And, 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 and you're just troubled. And a lot of people give up on going to church because they don't think they can measure up. Because they're operating in the flesh. You operate in the flesh, you will go to hell tired. Don and I went out this weekend, drove to Williamsburg Friday night at 8 o'clock. We left here to go to Williamsburg. Thought we were going to get a good night's sleep, and we wound up laughing and hooping and hollering at 4 o'clock in the morning, got up at about 7.30 and went out for the day, and then drove back last night. I know what tired means. I'm happy, but I'm exhausted. You try to make it into heaven through your flesh, you will go to hell exhausted. Martin Luther was a 16th century priest, Roman Catholic priest. 
And he'd been brought up to do all the sacraments and all of the rituals and all of the things. He was so very highly educated. And every night before he went to bed, he was miserable. He was scared to death and didn't know if he had done everything just right. And, and, and he said, how come if I do everything that people have told me to do that I still don't feel like I'm saved? I still don't feel like I'm on my way to heaven. And he was in such despair. And so he got the Bible out for himself. And he read Romans chapter 1 verse 17 where it says the just shall live by faith. And it completely revolutionized his world. And he truly got converted. And he truly got saved at that moment. And the crazy man started just shucking all of the rituals and all of the, the, the rites that he had learned. And he went up, went out and married a nun. <laughs> Catherine Von Bora. And I think they had something like 13 kids. That's what I call a conversion, brother, let me tell you. <laughs> All right. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith. That's the only way you can be justified in the eyes of God. You have faith in God and you walk in faith and he will tell you what you must do and what you must not do. He will show you if you're walking in the spirit of God. It said, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you make your peace with God. The old folks have an expression. Well, I sure hope he made his peace with God before he died. You ever heard that? I've said it before. That's how you make your peace with God is putting your faith in him, not in yourself. You put your faith in yourself and you are on your way to hell. Happy as a lark, aren't you? You are. You can't earn anything. You can't do anything without the Spirit of God. Does anybody realize how wretched they look in front of God without the blood of Jesus covering them? Does anybody know how awfully sinful we look even in our most righteous moment? If we don't have the Spirit of God and if we're not covered by the blood, we look horrible before God. The only way God can stand to look at me and you is to see the blood of Jesus covering each and every one of us when, when he looks down on us. Because this old body is at war with the spirit that lives inside of it until the day you get out of here. And it's, a, and it's a fight, it's a struggle to put this body in line so the spirit can take over. But that's how walking in the spirit is. You got to have faith that God can see you through everything that you're dealing with. He said, by whom we also have access by faith unto the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The grace that God wants to give you is accessed by the faith that you have in him. That's how that works. And he said, and not only so, but we, and this is a tough verse for me to read. But we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patient. Those are two words that Dave don't do real good with, but God is teaching him. And I'm not going to lie to you and act all lofty and all that, because y'all know I ain't lofty anyway. Anybody that drinks out of an NRA cup is not lofty. The two words is tribulation and patience. Whew. I do better with tribulations than I do with patience. But everybody in here will go through tribulations and it's not that God is doing something to hurt your feelings. He's trying to make you grow. He's trying to make you strong. He's trying to make you more like him and you got to go through some tribulations if that's ever gonna happen. You got to. 
There's some things you're going to have to deal with. And a lot of you in here already understand because you're walking through a trial right now. You're walking through the fire right now. Will you keep your faith in God because he's doing it to help you get stronger and grow? Because somebody else is going to walk in this church one day. Somebody else is going to walk in your house one day that's going to need that. And they're going to depend on you to give it to them. A woman walked up to Donna at Bush Gardens yesterday, we'd seen before there, and just sat down beside Donna for an hour and a half and poured her heart out. Donna had never spoken to her in her life, but it was all about advice on dealing with men. Here's the woman that has experience dealing with a crazy man for 33 years, so that worked out real good, didn't it, honey? See, God will bring you one out of the blue. Figured I'd better admit to that because she'd tell it anyway. Tribulations and trials, they will come your way if you truly love the Lord and you try to walk with the Lord and serve the Lord. It's going to happen. They come in one form or another. And that tribulation will work patience. That is one of the hardest things. Glenn was admitting his fault. Patience is one of mine. One of the main, main phrases that comes out of my mouth is, come on, let's go. Let's hurry up. Come on, let's do this. I've never had patience all of my life. My father was, I was taking him to the doctor the other day. He's 80. Well, he's eight, he'll be 80. Oh, my goodness. He'll be 87 in a couple of months. And I was telling him all the problems I had trying to grow a garden that nothing ever grew that I planted. And I did it exactly the way he told me. And, and it just nothing ever produced out of it. I spent $10 on tomato plants and got one tomato. And he just calmly looked over at me and he said, you know what your problem is, son? And I said, what is it, daddy? He said, you ain't got no patience, boy. That's what your problem is. He said, you can't grow a garden if you don't have any patience, so I'm not going to plant nothing this year. I'm going to mooch off of everybody else. How about that? I'm terrible. But God is slowly teaching me some of that by some of the things that I've had to go through and I've shared this with y'all before and I'm going to share this again the one point in my life was about a couple of years ago when God finally taught me some patience I'm always one of those that I want to fix something right now and I tell Donna don't tell me any problems that you got or anybody else has unless you want me to fix it right now. I know you're saying, honey, I don't want you to fix it. I want you to listen, but I can't listen without wanting to fix it. Anybody else have that problem in here? Anybody? Thank, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. The rest of y'all men are liars. Men are geared to want to go into action and fix it. And anytime we'd have something here at the church or whatever that needed fixing, be it spiritual or physical, I wanted to get right on it to find somebody that could do it. Well, we started getting a roof leak over where the, the chapel is now, the children's church area. And it started getting bigger and bigger and I tried to find where it was coming from and, and, and we didn't have any luck and I tried this and I tried that and I was getting so frustrated. And so finally in the middle of a terrible rainstorm one night, I was standing at the top of the steps over there to the left and I watched a river of water coming from upstairs down the stairs into the chapel. And I watched it coming from all different points and I was alone and it was at nighttime here and I just stood with my hands raised and said, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't fix this anymore. You're going to have to fix it. You're going to have to send me somebody that can do this. I give up. And lo and behold, after I finally did that, he sent along a, 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 a Jamaican preacher. He's been here before. He even sung one time with a guitar, Wessel Camel, wonderful man. 
And he went up on the roof and he found the hole and fixed it. And praise God, we haven't had a drop fall over there since then. I can do it, man. Just let me have a little bit of time. I can fix it, man. He did, too. But that teaches us patience. And God will put you in a position where you can't fix what's going on with you anymore. And he will teach you patience through that trial or that tribulation. And when you learn it, the Bible said that after that you have experience. You can share that with someone else. The experience that allowed you to make it through and the, the way that you learned patience. And then after that, hope. All of those things are available from Christ by putting your faith in him. Maybe you got to get to the point to where I said, I, I can't do this anymore, Lord. You're going to have to take this over completely. I'm out of options. I'm out of ideas. And he, as bad as that may sound, that's when God does his best work. He makes you holy by putting your faith completely in him and walking with him. And let me put it this way. You put your faith in God and the, the, the option of wanting to go out and sin will be the last thing on your mind. Once you start walking with him like you're supposed to, you're not going to have to worry about that. You won't have time. And hope maketh not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. If you don't love anybody in here, the Holy Spirit ain't living in you, buddy. He will give you a love for people that nobody else has love for. That's true. Had somebody the other day, we were joking about it. And somebody said, well, I heard from this and that to stay away from so-and-so. And I said, you know what? But 99% of this church in here, including me, people have all said stay away from them. <laughs> so y'all are in good company, aren't you? <laughs> I know they've said stay away from me plenty of times. But you will have a love for people. Then he said, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Christ didn't die for you after you got yourself straight and went to church. I hear that crap all the time. Is that all right to say that on the air? Okay, I said it. I've taught, you know, you go to people on the street and say, you know, would you like to come to church? And oh, oh yeah, I really would like to come to church, but I got to get myself straight before I come to church. And that's why they ain't sitting in here this morning. Yeah. They're still out there trying to get themselves straight. That'll never happen. Ever, ever, ever. God is the only one that can get you straight. That's right. You can't do it. If you could do it, why would you need to be here? Huh? You, maybe there's a lot of people think they are straight this morning. That's why I didn't come to church. I don't know. But in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for you when you were ungodly. He didn't wait for you to get yourself straight. And, 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 and like one, one pastor used to go around through a neighborhood going, if you can get a nice suit to wear and clean up and do this, we'd love to have you in church. And of course, nobody ever showed up because could nobody even afford that suit. Don't ever think that you got to wait to get this out of your life or get that out of your life before you come to church. You need to come right now just as you are because Christ wants you just as you are and he will clean you up. He will fill you with his spirit. If you walk with him in faith, he'll take care of that. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us.
for us. He had you on his mind when he was on the cross. How can that be? That was like 1,900 years ago. No, he's God. He knew everybody in the future as well as in the past and in the present. And you were on his mind when he died on that cross. You were one of those that he died for. That ought to make everybody happy to realize that God the Son would die for you and me as bad as we were. And even are. He still died for us. Nobody would do that. Anybody in here know somebody that would die for you? That's a rare thing, buddy. That's a very rare thing that anybody would ever do that. And they'd have to really love you a whole lot. And I don't know anybody in here that would go and die for somebody that won't their child or their parent or something like that. You can go die for them. Would you take your child and allow a bunch of Roman soldiers to nail your little child up on a cross because everybody in church is bad? Everybody in church is sinful? Of course not. Nobody would give their child up to that, but God did. While you were sinners, while you were still at enmity with him, much more now, verse 8, verse 9, excuse me. Can't read very well here with my glasses. Verse 9. Much more now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Just like Glenn was saying, judgment is coming on this world. You can count on that. That is more sure than death and taxes. Judgment is coming on this world, and when Jesus returns the next time, it will not be coming as a lamb, it will be coming as a lion, and it will be in wrath. Jesus is waiting to come and take his church and then deal with this earth, and when he does, it's going to be wrath time. He's not coming to die for anybody or anything like that. He's right now, he's waiting for everybody to accept him. He's given everybody every chance there is to get right with him by putting their faith in God. And when it's all done, he's going to come back and it's going to be wrath time. You can count on that. So we are saved from his wrath through his blood. By putting our faith in him. Not your works. You can try every ritual. Every rite. We can give you communion every day. We can take you back here and dunk you a hundred different times. But if you have not put your faith in God. And if you have not believed in him. And if you are not trusting him. Nothing does any good. Nothing. No matter what you try.